The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So welcome, everybody. My name is Yuan Ji Li. I'm a system professor of physics uh, uh, in the physics department. And uh, I will be your uh, instructor of this uh, semester uh, on AO3. So of course, one first question you have is, why do we want to learn about vibrations and waves? Why do we learn about this? Why do we even care, right? The answer is really, really simple. If you look at this uh, slide, you can see that the reason you can follow this class is because I'm producing sound wave by oscillating the air. And you can receive those sound waves. And uh, you can see me. That's already amazing by itself because there are a lot of photons or electromagnetic waves that are bouncing around in this room. And your eye actually receive those uh, electromagnetic uh, waves. And that translated to your brain waves. You will start to think about what, what this, this instructor is trying to tell you. And of course, all those things we learn from L3 is closely connected to probability density waves, which you will learn from L4, uh, quantum, um, uh, quantum physics. And the finally, it's also closely related to a recent discovery of the gravitational waves. When we are sitting here, maybe there are already some space-time distortion already passing through our body. And uh, you don't feel it. Okay? When I'm moving around like this, I'm creating also the gravitational waves. But it's so small as to be detected. Okay? So that's actually really cool. So the take-home message is that we cannot even recognize the universe without using waves and the vibrations. So that's actually why we care about this subject. And that's actually why this subject is so cool, even without quantum, without any fancy names. OK? So what is actually the relation of AO3 to other class or other field of studies? It's closely related to classical mechanics, which I will use it immediately. And I hope you still uh, uh, remember what you have learned from L1 and L2. Electromagnetic uh, 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 force is actually closely related also. And uh, we are going to use the technique we learned from this class to understand optics, quantum mechanics, and also there are many, many practical applications which you will learn from this uh, class. This is the concrete goal. We care about the future of our space time. We would like to predict what is going to happen uh, when we set up an experiment. We would like to design experiments which can improve our understanding of the nature. But without using the most powerful tool, it's very, very uh, difficult to make progress. So the most powerful tool we have is mathematics. Okay, you will see that it, it really works uh, in this class. But the first thing which we have to learn is how to translate physical situations into mathematics so that we can actually employ this very really wonderful tool to help us to solve problems. Once we have learned that, we will start to look at single harmonic oscillator. Then we try to couple all those oscillators together to see how they interact with each other. Finally, we, we go to an infinite number of oscillators. Sounds scary. But it's actually not uh, that scary after all. And uh, we will see waves, because waves are actually coming from infinite number of oscillating particles, if you think about it. Okay? Then we will do Fourier decomposition of waves to see what we can learn about it. We learn how to put together 
physical systems. That brings us to the issue of boundary conditions. And uh, we will also enjoy what we have learned by looking at the phenomena related to electromagnetic waves and practical uh, application and optics. OK? Any questions? If you have any questions, please stop me any time. OK? So if you don't stop me, and I'm going to continue and talk. OK? OK, so let's get started. So the first example, the concrete example I'm going to talk about is a spring uh, a block, massive block uh, system, OK? So this is actually what I have on, on that uh, table. So basically, I have a highly idealized spring. This is ideal spring with spring constant k and the natural length L0. OK, so that is actually what I have. And at t equal to 0, OK, at t equal to 0, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually move this mass a little bit. And I hold this mass still and release that really carefully. OK? So that is actually the experiment which I'm going to do. And we were wondering what is going to happen afterward. Will the, will the, the mass actually move? Will it stay there? Will it just pew, disappear? I don't know before I solve this question. OK? Now I have put together a concrete question to you, but I don't know how to proceed because, OK, you say everything in words. What I am going to do? I mean, I don't know, right? So as I mentioned before, there's a really powerful tool, mathematics, right? So I'm going to use that, OK? Even though I don't know why mathematics can work. Have you thought about it? OK. So let's try it and to see how we can make progress. So the first thing which you can do okay, in order to make progress is to define a coordinate system. Okay? So here I define uh, a coordinate system which is in the horizontal direction, is the x direction. And the x equal to 0, the origin, is the place which the uh, spring is not stretched. Is at, at, at its uh, natural length. That's actually what I defined as x equal to 0. And uh, once I define this, I can now express what is actually the initial position of the mass uh, by this uh, coordinate system. x0 it can be expressed as uh, x initial. And also, initially, I said that this mass is not moving. Therefore, the velocity at 0 is 0. OK? So now I can also formulate my question really concretely with uh, mathematics. Basically, you can see that at time equal to t, I was wondering where is this mass? So actually, the question is, what is actually x as a function of t? OK? So you can see that once I have the mathematics to help me, everything becomes pretty simple. So once I have those defined, uh, I would like to predict what is going to happen at time equal to t. Therefore, I would like to make use physical laws right, to actually help me to solve this problem. So uh, apparently, what we are going to use is Newton's law. And uh, I am going to go through this uh, example really, really uh, uh, slowly so that everybody is on the same page. So the first thing which I usually do is now I would like to do a force diagram analysis. Okay? So I have this mass. This setup is on the Earth. And the question is, how many force? How many forces are acting on this mass? Can anybody answer my question? Acceleration and the spring force. OK, so the answer is two. Any, any different? Three, OK. Very good. So we have two and three. And uh, the answer is uh, actually three. OK. So, so look at this uh, thing I drew in and the product, uh, product here. So this is actually the, the most difficult part of the question, actually. 
So once you pass this step, everything is straightforward. It's just mathematics. Okay, it's not my problem anymore, but the, the math department, they have problem, okay? <laughs> All right, so now let's look at this math, okay? There are three forces. The first one, as you mentioned correctly, is F spring, okay? It's pulling the mass. And since we are working on Earth, okay, we have not yet moved the whole class to moon or somewhere else, but uh, there will be gravitational force pointing downward, okay? But this thing is actually putting, this, the whole setup is on a table, a, a friction disk table. Therefore, there will be no more force, right? So don't forget this one. There will be no more force. So the answer is that we have three forces, okay? The normal force is a, actually a complicated subject, which you need to understand that with quantum physics, actually. Okay. Okay. So now I have the three force, and now I can actually calculate the total force. The total force F. F is equal to F S plus F N plus. Okay, so since we know that the mass, okay, is moving in the horizontal direction, the mass didn't really suddenly jump and uh, disappear, right? So, so it, it's, it's there. Therefore, we know that the normal force is actually equal to minus Fg, which is actually Ng in the y direction. And here I define y is actually pointing up and the x is pointing to the right hand side. Okay? Therefore, what is going to happen is that the total force is actually just Fs. Okay? And this is equal to minus k, which is the spring constant, and x, which is the position of the, the little mass uh, at time equal to t, okay? So once we have those, once we have uh, those forces and uh, the total force, actually we can use Newton's law. So F is equal to N times A, and this is actually equal to N d squared x t dt squared in the x direction, and that is actually equal to N x double dot t x. So here is the, my notation. I'm going to use each of the dot is actually the differentiation uh, with uh, respect to, to t, okay? So, so this is actually equal to minus k x t in the x direction. So you can see that here is actually what you already know about Newton's law, and that is actually coming from the force analysis, okay? So in this example, it's simple enough such that you can write it down immediately, but in the later examples, things will get very complicated, and uh, things will be slightly more difficult. Therefore, you will really need the help from the force diagram, okay? So now, we have everything in the x direction. Therefore, I can drop the x hat. Therefore, finally, my equational motion is x double dot t, and uh, this is equal to minus k over n x of t, okay? To make my life easier, Okay, I am going to define omega equal to square root of k over n. Okay, you will see why afterward. Okay, it looks really weird why Professor D wants to do this, but uh, afterward you will see that omega really have a meaning, and that is equal to minus omega square x. Okay, 
So we have solved this problem, actually, right, as a physicist. OK? Now the problem is, what is actually the solution to this differential, second order differential equation? And as I mentioned, this is actually not the content of AO3, actually. It's the content of 1803, maybe. OK? How many of you actually have taken 1803? Ooh, everybody knows the solution. So very good, I'm safe, OK? So what is the solution? The solution is x of t equal to a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t. So my friends from the math department tell me secretly that this is actually the solution. Okay? And I trust him. Okay? He, he or her, OK? So that's very nice. Now I have the solution. And how do I know this is the only solution? How do I know? Actually, there are two unknowns, right? Just sort of to remind you about what you have learned. There are two unknowns. And uh, if you plug this thing into this equation, you satisfy that equation, OK? If you don't trust me, you can do it after, uh, offline. It's always good to check, OK? So to, to make sure that I didn't make a mistake. But that's very good news. So that means we will have uh, a, uh, uh, two unknowns, and also it satisfies the, the equation. So by uniqueness theorem, this is actually the one and the only one solution in my universe, also yours, which satisfied the equation. OK? So because of the uniqueness theorem. OK? So I hope I have convinced you that we have solved this uh, uh, equation. So now I take my physicist hat back. And now it is actually my job again. So now we have the solution. And we need to determine what is actually these two unknown coefficients. So what I'm going to use is to, to use the two initial conditions. OK, the first initial condition is x of 0 equal to x initial. The second one is that since I release this mass really, really carefully, with and the initial velocity is 0. Therefore, I have x dot 0 equal to 0. OK? From, from this, you can solve, plug these two conditions into this equation. You can actually figure out that a is equal to x initial. OK? And the b is equal to 0. Any questions so far? OK. Very good. So now we have the solution. So finally, what is actually the solution? The solution we get is x of t equal to x initial cosine omega t. OK. So this is actually the amplitude of the oscillation. And this is actually the angular velocity. OK. So you, you, you may be asking, why angular? Where is the angular coming from? Right? Because this is actually a one-dimensional motion. And where is the ang angular velocity coming from? And I will, I will explain that in the later uh, uh, lecture, the part of the lecture. Okay? And also, this is actually a harmonic oscillation. So what we are actually predicting is that this mass is going to do this, okay? have a fixed amplitude. And it's actually going to go back and forth with the angular frequency of omega. Okay, So we can now do an experiment to verify 
if this is actually really the case. Okay, so there's a small difference. There's another uh, spring here, but essentially the solution will be very, very similar. You, will, you, you may get this in the, in the, in the P set or, or X set, right? Okay, so now I can turn on the air so that I make this surface friction this uh, and, uh, and you can see that now I actually move this thing slightly away from the equilibrium position and I release that carefully. So you can see that really it's actually going back and forth harmonically. Okay? I can, I can change the amplitude and see what will happen. Whoa, the amplitude is becoming bigger. And uh, you can see that the oscillation amplitude is really depends on where you put that initially with respect to the equilibrium position. I can actually make a small amplitude oscillation also. Now you can see that now the amplitude is small, but still oscillating back and forth. Okay. So that's very encouraging. Let's take another example, which I actually rotate the whole thing by 90 degrees. Okay, you are going to get a, a question about this system in your P set. The amazing thing is that the solution is the same. Oh, what is that? <laughs> and uh, if you don't believe me, let me do the experiment. Okay, I actually shift the position. Oh, okay, I change the position and I release that really carefully. You see that this mass is oscillating up and down. The amplitude did not change. The frequency did not change as a function of time. It really matched with the solution we found here. It's truly amazing, no? The problem is that we are so used to this already. You have seen this maybe 100 times before my lecture, so therefore you got so used to this. Therefore, you, when I say, okay, I make a prediction, this will happen, you are just so used to this or you don't feel the excitement. But for me, after I teach this class so many times, I still find this thing really amazing. Why is that? This means that actually mathematics really works, first of all. That means we can use the same tool for the understanding of gravitational waves, for the prediction of the Higgs boson, for the calculation of the property of the quark one plasma in the early universe, and also at the same time, the motion of, of this spring mass system. We actually use always the same tool, the mathematics, to understand this system. And nobody will understand why. If you understand why, please tell me. I would like to know. I would be very proud of you. <coughs> René Descartes said once, but in my opinion, all things in nature occur mathematically. Apparently, he's right. <laughs> Albert Einstein also once said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. So I would say this is really something really uh, we need to appreciate and really need to uh, think about why this is the case. Any questions? Okay. So you, you may say, oh, come on, this is, we just solved the problem of ideal spring, right? Who cares, right? It's so, so simple, so easy, and you, you are making really a, a big thing out of this, right? But actually, what we have been solving is really, really much more than that. This e equation is actually much more than just a spring mass system, okay? Actually, if you think about this question carefully, 
there's really no Hooke's law forever, right? Hooke's law will give you a potential proportional to x squared. And if you are so far away, you, you push the spring, pull the spring so really, really, really uh, you know, hard, it can store the, the energy of the whole universe. Does that make sense? No, right? At some point, it should break down, right? So there's really no Hooke's law. But there's also a Hooke's law everywhere, right? If you look at this system, uh, it follows the harmonic oscillation. If you look at this system, I perturb this, it goes back and forth, right? It's almost like everywhere. Why is this the case? I'm, trying to, I'm going to answer this question immediately. So let's take a look at an example. So if I consider a potential, this is an artificial potential, uh, which you can find in George's book, okay? So V is equal to E times L over X plus X over L, and then if you plot this as a function of X, then basically you get this funny shape, okay? It's not like proportional to X squared, Therefore, you will see that, okay, the resulting motion of the particle, if I put a particle in this potential, it's not going to be harmonic motion, okay? But if I zoom in, zoom in, and zoom in, and basically you will see that if I am patient enough, I zoom in enough, you see that, ha, huh, this is a parabola again. You will follow Hooke's law, okay? So that is actually really cool. So if I consider a bar arbitrary V of X, okay, we can do a Tyler expansion okay, to this uh, 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 potential. So basically V of X will be equal to V of zero plus V prime zero divided by one factorial times X plus V double prime zero over two factorial x squared plus V triple prime zero divided by three factorial x to the third plus infinite number of turns. And the V zero is the, the position of where you have minimum potential. Okay, so that's actually where the equilibrium position is. Okay, so in, in my coordinate system. Okay, it's the same as the coordinate system I use for the solving the spring mass uh, uh, question. Okay, so if I calculate the force, the force f of x will be equal to minus d dx v of x, and that will be equal to minus v prime. Uh, uh, v prime zero minus V double prime zero x minus one over two V double triple prime zero x squared plus many other terms, okay? Since I have mentioned that uh, V of zero, so V of zero, Vx, V of zero is actually the, 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 the position of the minima, right? Therefore, the prime of zero will be equal to zero. Okay, therefore, this term is gone. So what is actually left over is the remaining terms here. Okay, now if I assume that x is very small, what is going to happen? Anybody know when x is very small, what is going to happen? Anybody have the answer? Exactly, so when x is very small, he said that the higher order turns all become negligible. Okay, so that is actually correct, so when x it's very small, then I only need to consider the leading order term. But how small is the question, right? 
how small is small? Actually, what you can do is to take a ratio between, um, between these two terms, right? So if you take the ratio, then basically you get a condition x v triple dot zero should be much smaller than v uh, double prime zero. So that is actually the condition which is required to satisfy it so that we actually can ignore all the higher order terms. Then the whole question becomes f of x equal to minus v double prime zero x. And that is actually Hooke's law. So you can see that, first of all, there's no Hooke's law in general. Secondly, Hooke's law is actually applicable almost everywhere when you have a well-behaved uh, uh, potential. And uh, if you only perturb the system really slightly with very small amplitude, then it always works. So what I would like to say is that after we have done this exercise, you see that actually we have solved all the possible systems, okay, which have a well-behaved uh, 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 potential. It has a minima, and uh, if I have the amplitude small enough, then the system is going to do simple harmonic oscillation. Any questions? OK, no question, then we'll continue. So let's come back to this equation of motion. x double dot plus omega squared x, this is equal to 0. There are two important properties of this linear uh, equation of motion, OK? Uh, the first one is that um, if x1, if x1 of t and uh, x2 of t are both solutions, then x12, which is the superposition of the first and second solution, is also a solution. OK? The second thing which is very interesting uh, about this equation of motion is that there's a tra time translation invariance. So this means that if x of t is a solution, then x t prime equal to x t plus a is also a solution, OK? So that is really uh, uh, cool, because that means if I change t equal to 0, OK? So I shift the 0 time, OK? The whole physics did not change. So this is actually because of the chain rule. So if you have this chain rule, dx t plus a, dt, that is equal to d t plus a dt d x t prime dt prime evaluate here at t prime equal to t plus a and that is equal to d x t prime dt t prime equal to t plus a. So that means if I have changed the 
the t equal to zero to other place, okay, the whole equation of motion is still the same. On the other hand, if the k or say the potential is time dependent, then that may break this symmetry. Okay? Any questions? Okay, so before uh, we take a few minute break, a five minute break, I would like to uh, discuss further about this point, this linear and the nonlinear effect. So you can see that the force is actually linearly uh, dependent on x, right? But what will happen if I increase x more? Something will happen. That means the higher order term should also be taken into account carefully, okay? So that means the solution of this kind, x initial cosine omega t will not work perfectly, okay? In AO3, we only consider the linear term uh, most of the time. But uh, actually, I would like to make sure that everybody get this point. The higher order contribution is actually visible in our daily life. So that me actually give you a, a concrete example. So, so here, I have two uh, pendulums, okay? So I can now perturb this pendulum slightly and uh, you will see that, huh, it goes back and forth and uh, following simple harmonic motion, okay? So if I have both things slightly oscillating and uh, with small amplitude, what is going to happen is that both pendulums reach maximum amplitude at the same time. You can see, it. see that very really clearly. Okay, I, I need to do this carefully. You see that they always reach maximum at the same time when the amplitude is small. Why? That is because the higher order turns are not important. Okay, so now let's do an experiment. And now I go crazy. I make the amplitude very small, very large, so that I break that approximation. Okay, so let's see what happened. So now I do this then. Okay, I do this then at the same time, and see what happened. You see that ah, originally they are in phase. They are reaching maximum at the same time. But if we are patient enough, you see that now they are oscillating, oscillating actually at different frequency, okay? Originally, the solution, the omega, is really independent of the amplitude, right? So they should actually be oscillating at the same frequency. But clearly you can see here, when you increase the amplitude, then you need to consider also the nonlinear effect, okay? So any questions before we take a five minute break? Okay, so if not, then we will take a five minute break and we uh, come back here at 25. So welcome back everybody. Uh, so we will continue the discussion of this uh, equation of motion x double dot plus omega squared x equal to zero, okay? So there are three possible way to write the solution to this uh, equation. So the first one, as I mentioned before, x of t equal to a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t, right? So this is actually the, the functional form we have been using before. And we can actually also rewrite it in a different way, okay? So x of t equal to a, capital A, cosine omega t plus phi. You may say, wait a second, you just promised me that this is the first one, the one is the one and only one solution in the universe which actually satisfy the equation of motion, right? Now you, have, you, you write another one. What is going on? Why, right? 
but actually they are the same, right? <laughs> okay, this is actually a cosine phi cosine omega t minus a sine phi sine omega t. Okay, so the good thing is that a and the phi are arbitrary constant, so that it should be you can use two initial conditions to determine the arbitrary constant. So you can see that one and two are completely equivalent, okay? So, okay, so I hope that solves some of the uh, uh, questions because uh, people usually find it really confusing why we have different presentations of the uh, solution. Okay, so there's a third one, which is actually much more fancier, okay? The third one is that I have x of t. This is actually a real part of a, again, the amplitude, exponential i omega t plus five, where i is equal to square root of minus one. Wait a second, we will say, Professor D, why are you writing such a horrible solution? <laughs> right? Really strange. But I will explain you why. Okay. So three is actually a mathematical trick. Okay? I'm not going to prove anything here because I'm a physicist. Okay? But I would like to share with you what I think is going on. I think three is actually just a mathematical trick from the math department. Um, in principle, I can write it in an even ho more horrible way. X of t equal to a real part of A cosine omega t plus phi plus I f of t, and uh, f of t is a real function. Okay. In principle, I can do that, right? It's even more horrible. Why is that? Because if I now have this function, I take a real part, and then I actually take the two out of this, uh, uh, this uh, operation, right? So f of t is actually a real function. It can be something arbitrary. And uh, I can now plot the locus of this function, this solution, on the complex plane. OK? Now I am plotting this uh, solution on this complex plane. What is going to happen is that you are going to have That is actually what you are going to get. If I'm lucky, if this f of t is confined in some specific region. If I'm not lucky, then it goes out of the plane, and I couldn't see it, okay? Maybe it go to the moon or something, okay? But if you are smart enough, and I'm sure you are, if I choose f of t equal to a sine omega t, plus five. Can anybody tell me what is going to happen? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you become a, a circle. Very good. If I plot the locus again of this function, the real axis, imaginary axis, then you actually get the circle. Some miracle happened, right? If you choose the f of t correctly, wisely, okay, then you can actually turn all this mass into order, okay? Any questions?
So I can now follow up about this. So now I have x of t. This is equal to the real part of a cosine omega t plus phi plus i a sine omega t plus phi. OK? And the, just a reminder, exponential i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. Therefore, I arrive this. This is a real part of A exponential i omega t plus phi. OK? So if I do this really carefully, I look at this, the position uh, of the, the point at a specific time. So now time is equal to t, OK? And this is the real axis, and this is the imaginary axis. So I have this circle here, OK? So at time equal to t, what you are getting is that x is actually, uh, OK, before taking the real part, a exponential i omega t plus phi is actually here. And uh, this vector actually shows the amplitude. Amplitude is a. And uh, the angle between uh, this uh, vector pointing to the position of this uh, uh, function is omega t plus phi. OK, so this is actually the, 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 phi, uh, the angle between this vector and the real axis. OK, so that's pretty cool, right? Why? Because now I understand why I call this omega angular velocity or angular frequency, right? Because the solution to the equation of motion, which we have actually derived before, OK, is actually the real part of the rot a rotation in the complex plane, OK? If you think about it, so that means now I see this particle going up and down. Okay, I see this particle going up and down. You can think about that it is as if there's an extra dimension which you couldn't see. Okay, actually this particle in the in the dimension we, we can see and the extra dimension which is hidden is actually rotating. And what we see, the reality, is a projection to the real axis. You see? So, so in, in reality, this particle is actually rotating. OK, if you add the imaginary extra dimension. OK? So that is actually pretty cool, but the purity artificial, right? So you can see that I can choose f of t to be a different function, and then, then this whole picture is different. But I also will create a lot of trouble because then the mathematics become complicated. I didn't get anything. But by choosing this functional form, you actually arrive at a very beautiful picture. OK? Another thing which is very, very cool about this is that if I write this thing in this form, in the exponential functional form, OK, since we are dealing with differential equations, there is a very good property about exponential function. That is, it is actually a Phoenix function. Do you know what is a phoenix? Phoenix is actually some kind of animal, long-lived bird, which is cycle, uh, 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 cyclical, uh, regenerating or reborn. So basically, when, when, when this phoenix dies, you lay an egg in the fire, and then you will reborn. Okay? This is actually the same as this function. I can do differentiation. 
still an exponential function. I differentiate, 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 still exponential function. Right? So that is very nice because when we deal with uh, uh, differential equation, then you can actually remove all those dots and then make them become just an exponential function. Okay? So it's a really a very uh, nice property. So the first property, which is very nice, is that it cannot be killed by differentiation. You will see how useful this is in the following uh, uh, lectures. OK? The second thing, which is really nice, is that it has a very nice property. So basically, exponential i theta 1 times exponential i theta 2, and that will give you exponential i theta 1 plus theta 2. Right? So what does that mean? That means if I have a solution in this form, a exponential i omega t uh, plus phi, OK? And I do a time translation, uh, t become t plus a, OK? Then this become a exponential i omega t plus a plus phi. So this means that time translation, OK, time translation in this notation is just a rotation in the complex plane. You see? So now t becomes t plus a, then you are actually just changing the angle between this vector and, uh, and the x-axis. OK? So as time goes on, what is going to happen is that this thing will, will go around and around and around. And uh, the physics is always the same. No matter when do you start counting, and the uh, translation is just a rotation uh, in, in this print. Any questions? OK? So, I think uh, this is actually a basic slide. Uh, just to remind you about uh, Euler's uh, formula. So basically, the exponential i uh, phi is equal to uh, cosine phi plus i sine phi. And I think it will be uh, useful, if you are not familiar with this, it is useful to actually uh, review a little bit about exponential function, uh, uh, which will be very useful for this class. OK, so I am running a bit faster today. So I think uh, uh, let's uh, take a look at what we have learned uh, today. We have analyzed the physics of a harmonic oscillator. So basically, we, we start by asking, asking a really uh, just a verbal question. OK, what is going to happen to this mass on the table attached to a spring? And what we have learned is that we actually use uh, 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 mathematics. Basically, we translate all what we have learned uh, about, uh, this, uh, uh, about, uh, about this uh, mass uh, into mathematics by first define a coordinate system. Okay? Then I write everything in terms of the, that coordinate, uh, using that coordinate system. Then I use Newton's law to help us to, to solve this question. OK? And uh, we have analyzed the physics of this uh, harmonic oscillator. And uh, Hooke's law, we found that it actually not only works for this uh, 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 spring mass system, it also works for oscillation, all kinds of different small oscillations about, about a point of equilibrium. OK? So basically, um, it's actually a universal solution, what we have been doing. And we have found that a complex uh, exponential function is actually a, a beautiful way to present the solution 
to the equation of motion we have been studying, okay? So everything is nice and good. However, life is hard because there are many, many things which actually we ignore and in this example, okay? One apparent thing which we actually ignore is the drag force, right? So you can see that before I was actually making this pendulum oscillate back and forth, right? What is going to, what is happening now? They are not oscillating anymore. Why? Why are they stopping, right? Apparently something is missing, right? When I actually move this system, okay, if I turn off the, the air so that there's friction, then it doesn't really move, right? If I increase a bit the air so that it slide, have some slight freedom, then actually you can see that it move a bit, then it stop, right? If I increase it some more, you can see that you can see that the amplitude becomes smaller and smaller. So in the following lecture, what we are going to do is to study how to actually include a drag force into the GAN. And of course, using the same machinery which we have learned from here, and see if we can actually solve this problem. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we actually end up earlier today, sorry for that. And uh, maybe I will make the lecture longer next time. <laughs> okay, and uh, if you have any questions about what we have covered today, I'm here available uh, for your, to help you. <laughs>